Welcome back. So in this particular video, we got a lot of moving pieces here, but we're going to talk about the review of agency theory, specifically as it's applied to venture capital. Now you're probably thinking, wait, did we talk about agency theory before? You can't remember? Yes, we did. Okay. Agency theory is normally applied to publicly traded companies. That's where we normally think of it, but it can be applied in many contexts. But it basically means that agents or managers of companies or executives of companies may have different interests than owners or investors of a company. So you think about when you buy stocks in your favorite company, you hope that the managers act in your best interests as the owners, so make sure the stock price goes up or whatever, but in reality, the managers of the company may have their own set of interests that do not match yours. So they may do things that are adverse for the company, therefore the owners, but benefit them personally, right? By the same token, you as the owners may wish to do things that are good for the company, but are adverse for the management, uh, management through the executives. So the goal is to make sure that there is a degree of alignment between the interests of the managers and the interests of the owners. So when we apply agency theory to venture capital, you want to make sure that the interests of the entrepreneur match the interests of the fund manager, the venture capitalist, um, the limited partners, right? So first of all, you got to accept markets are imperfect, right? We are talking about entrepreneurship, we are not talking about economics. Let me illustrate for a moment. And if you're, in, if you're interested in some of these concepts, I draw a lot from Austrian economics here. I have a whole playlist on my channel about Austrian economics, and if you're having trouble finding it, guess what? I'm wearing the same color t-shirt in that video series too, so it should be pretty easy to find. So if I were to draw our classic supply and demand curve out here, we're taught in economics class that markets are geared towards this perpetual state of equilibrium, right? And part of that the reason that's possible is because consumers have access to perfect information at all times and they make perfectly rational decisions. In other words, customers are rational people. They know all the right answers. They have all the data before they make that choice. And then they can just go ahead and make the right decision for them. So in other words, imagine if you were to go to Walmart and you see a shelf of peanut butter and there's like 15 different varieties, right? You, because you are a perfectly informed customer, can know immediately which peanut butter is right for you. You know, there's 15 brands, but you can identify that exactly the right one has the right protein content, the right fat count, it's organic, and it's the right price for you. You don't have to look at all the other peanut butter jars. You just take it because you know. Or maybe you don't know, but what you do is you take each peanut butter thing off the shelf and you look. It's like, okay, tastes great, less filling. Tastes great, less filling. Ooh, great price. Does that really happen when we go to Walmart? No, it doesn't. Okay. Instead, what winds up happening, you're sitting there with your, your shopping cart, your wife is screaming at you, throwing things at you, the children are, are screaming and crying and knocking stuff off the shelf. You're like, uh, blue, it's my favorite color. I take the peanut butter with the blue jar and we move on. Okay. So what we're saying is in reality, customers don't have access to perfect information. Okay. And so what we mean is that markets are moving towards perpetual disequilibrium. So I put these little things here to indicate movement, kind of vibration, right? And so you could have potentially, you know, some of these other points in reality. And the entrepreneur creates a business based on these information asymmetries. And as they restore that equilibrium, they of course make a profit. That's one way of illustrating this concept okay, from Austrian economics. Another way of illustrating it would be that there are multiple markets. Let's see, yeah, we should be able to see here. And so you have a supply and demand curve on day one, supply and demand curve on day two, supply and demand curve on day three. So this perfect equilibrium that exists today because people know about it, they interact with it, and therefore moves into disequilibrium, and then it moves towards equilibrium, but once that equilibrium is achieved, the next day conditions are different, and so that there's a brand new supply and demand curve every single day. It's another way of looking at it, right? Okay. 
So either way, markets are imperfect, including that is asymmetric information, meaning that the entrepreneur doesn't know everything that the venture capitalist knows, and the venture capitalist doesn't know everything that the entrepreneur knows. So they don't make the perfect decision, right? And in fact, if we, they did make perfect decisions, venture capitalists would invest in the right fund or the right company 100% of the time. It wouldn't be one of those cases where, you know, 19 of the companies fail and one of them is the home run, and therefore that's, you know, that's how they make all their money, right? They would only invest in the perfect ventures every time. So we know that there's, you know, asymmetric information. Right? The entrepreneur knows more about his or her business than the venture capitalist, and the venture capitalist knows more about what he or she wants, or his or her firm wants, than does the entrepreneur. We also call this the peach and the lemon problem. Thank you, one Sorry about that, some allergies today. So we call this the peach and the lemon problem. Now this is referring to cars, right? You know, when you buy a used car, the person selling the used car to you may be selling you a lemon. So they may withhold information that's negative from you so that you're inclined to buy the car. So you might actually wind up, you know, it's a beautiful car, it smells great, whatever, but, you know, the engine is totally bad. The seller may hide that information from you in order to make that sale. So they're selling you a lemon, a bad car. Alternatively, there's the peach problem, where you've got a great car and a great piece of technology and it's so wonderful but you're not able to adequately communicate that into a way that the buyer understands. Let's say the engine is like the most amazing thing ever and you're trying to explain why it's so amazing but you're maybe either either you can't explain it that well because you don't understand it or the buyer doesn't know enough about cars to appreciate it. Okay? So that's how this this information asymmetry. And this information asymmetry is further exacerbated by the fact that startups have a really poor track record. It's a new thing. So you know, they're trying to explain that they think the market will look like this, they think the firm will look like this, they think everything is going to be great, but they have no data to really back it up, or they have very limited data, right? So this exacerbates this asymmetric information. And this is where we talk about more on the hidden characteristics, right? There's hidden stuff, okay? The entrepreneur doesn't necessarily know the future, and the entrepreneur is either deliberately withholding information because they're trying to sell a lemon to the venture capital group, or they're really enthused about what they're trying to do, but they can't explain it, and that's the peach problem. By the same token, the venture capitalists are sitting there and they're trying to figure out whether it's a lemon or a peach, but they're outside the firm. And they'll do all this fancy analysis, but it's still a best case judgment, so they don't exactly know. Um, furthermore, the entrepreneurs may not know why a venture capital company is actually buying their firm. Right? They think it's because they want to invest and everything's great, but imagine this. Imagine a venture capital firm has a very similar product already in their portfolio, so they're incentivized to buy your company so that they can get all your information to enrich the profit margins of this firm that they already own, right? So the venture capital group also may have nefarious interest for investing in you. They may just want to take your information and then shut you down, right? So you don't know as the entrepreneur either. So there's a little bit of what we call moral hazard on both sides of the table, right? Then we also have the smoker's dilemma, and this can lead to adverse selection. Why do we call this the smoker's dilemma? Okay? Think about somebody who's a smoker, and they want to get a life insurance policy. Right? And when you call the life insurance company, they ask you some questions. So, you know that if you're a smoker, and you answer, yes, I'm a smoker, you've got to pay $500 a month because smokers are at a risk of dying sooner. Right? So you don't want to reveal that information. Let's say the non-smoker only pays $100 a month for the same life insurance policy. So you as the smoker are going to say you're not a smoker so you can pay just $100 a month for your life insurance policy. But the, see, the insurance company knows that too. They know that people lie about their smoking activities. So what they do is on TV they say, okay, we're going to have a policy where we don't ask you any health questions in advance. You see that now. Oh, you know, that's great. They're not going to ask me any health questions in advance. So what do they wind up doing? Maybe they price the insurance policies at like, $300 instead, right? Somewhere between the $500 a month and the $100 a month. And they do that, it produces not a very good outcome for anybody, right? So smokers, yeah, they do have to pay a little bit less, but think of all the non-smokers that have to pay so much more to pay for those people that are smoking, but then they lie on their questionnaires, okay? So how does that relate to adverse selection? It's the same thing about this lemon and peach dilemma when you're investing 
or when a venture capital firm is investing in an entrepreneurial startup. They know that entrepreneurs either will deliberately not be forthcoming or won't be able to explain everything, so they may make the wrong decision. They may not make the best decision. So they may wind up overlooking certain firms that can really enrich their portfolio while selecting firms that are not the best for their portfolio. And that's bad for the entrepreneur that's got a great idea that doesn't get the investment. And in many ways, it's also bad for the, uh, the poorly functioning venture because Remember, now you've got people investing in you. Now you've got to be held accountable when you might have been better off just quitting and doing something else. So it's bad for the entrepreneurs, but it's also bad for the venture capitalists because they miss opportunities to give their investors better returns. So that's what we mean by adverse selection. And so all of this that we've talked about here deals with what we call pre-contractual information asymmetry. When you sign that contract, you don't know everything. right? You've got to take a little bit of a leap of faith. Okay? So that contract, by definition, will therefore be incomplete. You will not write a contract that has every single contingency because you don't necessarily know all the facts up front. So contracts, therefore, by definition, are incomplete. And there's always these new things that can pop up. Okay? This gets kind of iffy. We also have what we call post-contractual information asymmetry. So great, the contract has been signed, but tying it back to agency theory, you know that the entrepreneurs may do things that are in their interest and not in the interest of the venture capital firm and, or in the interest of the limited partners. So that's where we get into this moral hazard. They may take the money and run. They may um, go behind your back and write other contracts. They may do a number of things, right? So this is information asymmetry post-contractual. So we gotta worry about both when it comes to agency theory. Do you have all the facts when you go in before you actually, you know, when you're doing your screening and analysis? Are you making the best decision or are you making, you'll never make the best decision, but are you making a better decision? And after the fact, are you able to monitor the firm to make sure that they adhere to their terms of the agreement? This is a nightmare, right? However, there are some mechanisms that we have that can resolve this whole problem of agency theory or the principal agent problem and we're going to talk about that in the next playlist. As always, if you like this video, hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and comment down below. Here's my question for you, the YouTube audience. Have you ever dealt with a peach or a lemon, whether it's in venture capital or buying a car? Let me know in the comments down below. Hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one.